This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Unhinged. Let's dynamite the sex and gender binomial as a political practice. The Whore, Dyke, Black, Trans Feminist Network in their text, Manifesto for the Trans Feminist Insurrection. Put simply, the gender binary is part and parcel of capitalism's division and devaluation of gendered labor, and socio-political gender transgression marks a distinctly anarchic practice. I've argued up to this point that capitalism, the Marxist analytic baby, is not reducible simply to patriarchy, much less all society's ills reducible to it. A further question remains, though, in typical academic one-upsmanship fashion. Is capitalism reducible to cis-patriarchy? That is, where are, the, where are the trans people in all of this, the genderqueer and non-binary, the agendered and gender-neutral? The fact that this or that particular critique of patriarchy is unaccompanied by an adequately lengthy meditation on the interstices of the gender binary does not automatically make its entire sociopolitical apparatus suspect. Often, stating that a theoretical mode omits a marginalized group is seen as sufficiently rigorous scholarship and argumentation. I find this trite. To be frank, surely any narrowness in who gets included among the marginalized has deep implications, hence the always necessary acknowledgement of the gender normative assumptions of many critiques of patriarchy. But the discussion can't stop there. In this chapter, I will move beyond the practice of pointing out insufficiencies latent in critiques of patriarchy that are made without an acknowledgement of its assumed cisgenders, and as the Horde Dyke Black Trans Feminist Network insists, dynamite the gender binary as my political practice, not an afterthought of political practice. My aim is to begin there and carry out not only a destructive critique, but a productive supplementation, a la Bakun's creative destructive passions, that articulates what comes after. If we start with a series of explosions, what does the terrain look like after the smoke dissipates? By exploding the sex and gender binary, we reject the distinctions between the naturalness of sex and the culturalness of gender. Black and trans feminist anarchism here does not abide such claims and insists on nothing the ex- nothing noting insists on noting externally imposed coercive constructions of sex as well. Sex, in other words, is gendered. We cannot find solace in presumed biological naturalness as something outside the coercions of the state. How we are gendered is a product of how the state and its various apparatuses seek to discipline and produce, to coerce and hierarchize different desires, bodies, and comportments. There is a political and ethical interest in the question of gender, which becomes anarchically pertinent when viewing it not or viewing it as not an unmediated natural phenomenon, but a historical production that serves the interests of the state. Those anarchistically concerned with gender, who have been called anarchist sexed radicals, argue that gender as a binaristically construed rests at the heart of society's structuration. Binary gender is regulated by the law institutions, religion, medicine, and other various societal authorities. A radical departure from the state then necessitates a radical departure from compulsory binary genders. This is old, This ultimately requires seeing gender and its transgressions as more than a mere lifestyle choice without political ramifications. Transgressions of gender must not be filed only under personal preference, and transgressions of gender are not, in and of themselves, the anarchic act we seek. Gender transgression must have a sociogenic effect. That is, more than doing gender radically for oneself, which is still a valiant and meaningful act, one must subjectivate the social landscape via gender transgressivity or ungendering. If the very ground on which we stand is buttressed by adherence to the gender binary, to traverse anarchic ground requires a... 
vitiation of a constitutive gender binary of that ground, the blackness of anarchic ground is inextricable from the gender transgressions of anarchic ground. Blackness does not abide upholding the binaristic gender. Blackness as too cute for binaries. Blackness as persistent and insistent gender trouble. Blacknesses and its embodied, embedded feminism uh, trans inscrutability, to borrow insight from the language of Sheikh Asat. The world we traverse must become saturated with the deregulation of gender or unsaturated with gender, when then creates an anarchic world. Disorder. Flipping the script is not enough. It is not enough to simply insist on the femaleness of the future or yearn for black people to rule the world. Wanting a representational subject that embodies all the marginalized demographics we can and can't imagine will not, I repeat, will not actualize a radical anarchic world. Representation is not our end goal, not only because representation implies the non-participation of those whom the representation ultimately represents, that is, the representative holds power only when those they represent are absent, which is antithetical to the anarchic drive for direct participation. Representation also assumes a legible subject, which must align with the normative logics of social ontological existence to represent someone or something that someone or something has to already be known. But if anarchism wants to destroy the extant system, and if the extant system dictates what is and, and can be known, its destruction means that what arises after cannot be known or represented. It will be anarchic possibility, unanticipated and unbeholding to our current tenets of legibility. So anarchism allows for nothing but what is unallowable, not even quote-unquote women that feminists go to cite for the historically oppressed can be our political figure it excludes too much and as the core dyke black trans feminist network notes leave out the dykes trans the whores and the ones who wear veils the ones who earn little and don't go to the university the ones who yell the immigrants without legal resident papers the fags these are the ones who encircle the kind of force that drives anarchism, which is to say the anarcho, because after all, we know that there are capitalists and proverbial masters who accept transgender folks and folks of color and gay folks and women. All of these identifiable identities can be co-opted and serve power. I posit here the necessity of the black and trans synecdoches syn for what chapter describes this ch the synecdoche is for what this chapter describes as unhinged because they name the an original transivity that radical gender theorizing has deemed the revolutionary force that gives radicalized blackness and transgenders over to what is often understood as radical politics. Black and trans name the revolutionary force uncapturable by racial capitalism and heteronormative cis patriarchy, and they are pushing us toward explosions in ways of being, ways of organizing, and ways of living. It is useful to meditate a bit on two anarchist concepts, uh, what have been dubbed anarchic feminism and tranarchism. The former anarchic Anarchex feminism first makes a rhetorical move to distinguish women from femmes, advancing femmes as the category of analysis as woman or women too often presumes a cisgender alignment and cannot hold those who express themselves femininely yet do not have women's or female bodies. Again, the whore dyke black trans feminist network's axiom that women is an exclusionary category presents itself. Anarchics, an, yeah, anarchics, feminists mobilize for abolishing the hierarchical distinction between fems and cis men, leveling the playing field as it were. It is a way to organize socially in a way that removes gendered hierarchies, a removal that is not obsessed as traditional anarcho feminists have been merely with men and women, but adds nuance to the gendered expression, identification, and comportment. As a social organizing principle, it must pervade all forms of social life. 
and social life, including the private sphere. Fems must be granted complete autonomy over their own bodies, according to Anarch X feminists, and be permitted to make decisions by themselves and with other Fems if matters concern only Fems and on quote unquote equal footing with matters that bear everyone. Collective matters concerning everyone might include cohabitation and communal dwellings, and individual or Fem specific matters might include, as they say, contra- contraception and childbirth. We see here, though, a problematic assumption and persistent conflation of femme with those with the capacity to bear and birth children. There is an emphasis on both individual and collective fighting back against cis male domination, ownership over property and others, specifically femmes, bodies, and and repressive juridical impediments, which will all contribute to achieving femmes, economic, and social autonomy and independence. Anarch X feminism also finds it imperative to establish crisis centers that address issues of gendered violence and livelihood, as well as centers for child care and elderly care. It has a sustained focus on study and discussion reminiscent of feminist con- consciousness raising groups of the 1960s and 70s and on cultural activities that focus on fem life. All of these anarch X feminists insist must be run under fem's own direction. Furthermore, the family unit historically and contemporarily patriarchal, should be replaced by free associations between people with all kinds of genders based on equal right to decide for all parts and with respect for the individual person's autonomy and integrity. Like anarchists past, the driving force is not to replace the leaders of existing systems with women or femmes. Anarchax feminism of following in the vein of other radical feminists and anarchists, quote, does not stand for femme power or femme prime ministers. It stands for organization without power and without prime ministers, end quote. In turn, trenarchism, a, t- a term coined by Ellis L. Herman, gives nominative testament to the convergencies of transgender or for this meditation, trans and anarchism. Trenarchism's critique dates back to classical anarchists, but more saliently respond to 1970s U.S. progressivism and sexual radicalism. For all the era's radicality, there is still the assumption, even within anarchist circles, of the immutability and naturalness of the gender binary, the gains of the era for an essentialized, biologized notion of women in the form of rape crisis centers and women's health collectives that are monumental feats that should be, of course, lauded. Anarchism's women's movement, too, contributed to these gains and amplified the importance of women's roles in bringing about a new society. Within all of this, the broader women's liberation movement and anarcho-feminism, there was still a unification on the basis of shared womanhood and, more specifically, a genitally defined understanding of sex that had the patriarchy as its sole adversary. To bring in transgender issues and epistemologies to anarchism would be reductive. If it, if it only means that transgender people begin to take up the theorizations of Kropotkin and Bakunin. Furthermore, though much closer to what transarchism might aim to be, it is not enough to say that people of trans experience, quote, are radical and anarchistic, if not insurrectionary in their embodiment. There is truth to this insofar as to undergo a change to whatever extent in gender is to transgress the purported immutability of gender. Transgender embodiment, the limits and scope of which is to remain open and unencumbered by criteria for sufficient transness, might always be transgressive in some respect by virtue of its defiance of the binary restrictions on gender. But this can only be taken so far. Transgender embodiment is not in and of itself an anarchic revolution. Herman takes issue with the belief that the transgender body, which is and looks like exactly, is inherently revolutionary. Such a belief is problematic on a number of fronts. In Herman's own words, the proclamation that trans embodiment possesses innately anarchic qualities, however, is problematic. 
The most obvious issue comes with the need to define transgender, which is deliberately unspecific and amorphous as an expression or embodiment that always serves a single purpose. Do the non-operative transsexual sex worker and the post-mastectomy non-binary porn star possess the same potential or desire to dismantle the state? Looking at the intersections of identity and oppression, the answer would probably be negative. Claiming that all transgender bodies possess inherent insurrectionary potential places the impetus upon transgender individuals to serve a revolutionary purpose without regard for their own safety, survival, or preference. This perspective places the responsibility for critiquing and challenging gender norms upon trans people alone. Cisgender individuals are, then, exempt from the expectation to use their genders for the revolutionary purpose. When examining the role of trans gender and anti-authoritarianism, anti-authoritarianism, it is critical to remember that anarchic is an adjective, not an equalizer. The issue here is monolithizing transgender as having one sole purpose and thus one sole kind of body and bodily effect. To say that transgender embodiment is itself transgressive presumes an epistem an, an epistemic stranglehold on the mutinous riotous refusal of a proper body that the trans of transgender means in much of contemporary trans studies the presumption disallows transgender to be other than what it has been defined from without as and disallows different kinds of trans necesses transnesses it also forces upon trans people the burden of transgressing gender and thus having an interrogative relation to the gendered capitalist state to fix gender and transgression in transgender embodiment whatever one defines this as let cisgender people off the hook implying that they do not need to transgress the state's course of gender impositions as such, this critique asserts that the anarchic is not to be rooted in certain bodies that then bear the weight of taking on the state. Rather, anarchic must be adjectival, modificatory, a descriptor of a way of relating to power and not an immutable claimed identity. We will provide a meditation on the convergencies of transness as prefixal and blackness in the next section. So here I want simply to offer trans's link to blackness through the anarcho. My concern is how one bears a trans relationship to normativity and specifically normative gender, which is not merely the clothes one wears or the inflection in one's voice, but a relative mobilization of subjective gendered effect to express a trans relationship to gendered normativity is to socio politically deploy one's own gender as well as gendered sociality in non-normative subversive ways that bring about a different ungendered world those who bear a trans relationship to normative gender absolutely include those who identify as and may be identified as transgendered uh, and thus subject to airport surveillance and bodily violation being fired from jobs without recourse for redress physical violence and the like it also though includes those who may be cisgender yet operate through a space in, in ways that disrupt normative gender assumptions via interrogating the act of gendering strangers, denorming cisgender by making plain one's pronouns even when they are obvious, or undermining linear gendered assumptions predicated on an asserted cisgender identity, that is, refusing the coercive expectations of cisgender behavior and comportment even though one might identify as cisgender. In short, anarchism must exude a kind of transness inasmuch as gender's binaristic conception rests at the fundament of the state and trans- epistemologies, lives, and discourses provide a template for anarchic praxis, for getting outside and across and beyond, etymologically trans, the cisgender racial state.
When it is operating at its best, anarchism is tearing down the borders of nation states, smashing the borders of capitalist control, and transgressing all borders of oppression and authoritarianism. When queerness is operating at its best, it is tearing down the borders of gender, smashing the confines of compulsory monogamy, and transgressing the moralism of sex and sexuality. James Linden in the text, Tearing Down the Walls, Queerness, Anarchism, and the Prison Industrial Complex. I have argued for what C. Riley Snorton calls referential overlapping of blackness and transness in numerous places elsewhere in my work. That is to say, blackness is thrust as a paraontological or sub- Objectivity in excess of an imposed ontology, a way of inhabiting oneself in ways not to be holden to state impositions of legible identity, as well as its racialized history necessarily troubles and unfixes gender. Those who have been blackened cannot contain Uh, cannot be contained in the symbolic order of gender. The order of gender is anarchically obliterated by blackness. Gender here is understood as a historical contingent mode of sociopolitical comportment externally imposed upon bodies fixed into a binary. Blackness both as a miasmic fugitive spirit and as a discernible physiognomy has not abided this binary. Gender is a pre- is predicated on whiteness. We see in this era of U.S. enslavement in which, quote, no uniform or shared category of gender included the mistress and the enslaved or, or white women and black women, end quote, because black laboring women troubled gender conventions. We see this in how as black trans women uh, and black trans woman, Shadi Devereaux notes, black women's womanhood is inherently viewed as drag performance and that the assumption is always that black women are all imitating true women. We all we usually overlook this in how we view what it means to be trans and cis and who has access to narratives of womanhood. We see it in short in how blackness troubles gender as non-sovereign and metapolitical blackness makes for gender trouble. There is then a fundamental inextricability between blackness and transness as to a metapolitical disruptive force of binaristic static gender. Anarcho-blackness indexes this in its refusal of the state and its accoutrements, which includes binary gender and imposed ontologies. Reading blackness into and as anarchism must engage the trans of the matter, no black anarchist organization or discourse discourse currently available gives you a respectable sustained meditation on the import of transgender or non-normative genders. Surely, if one is looking for how to unravel all hierarchies, race and gender chief among them, and surely if we recognize how endemic race and gender, or more accurately white supremacy and sick, cis-sexist heteropatriarchy are to state capitalism, then it bears acknowledgement that those who transgress and virtually destroy the presumptions of these things should feature prominently. But no, one sees almost no mention of those who are not cisgender and barely a mention of the very fact of trans existence. But if it is growing more known that, to quote Seda Hartman, the gender nonconformity of the black community is the axiom from which we begin black liberatory work. Then it becomes imperative to deeply wrestle with how transness bears on our conversations surrounding blackness and, well, anything. Recognition of the interwovenness of blackness and transness establishes an anarchic understanding of gender through self-determination, axiomatic in both transgender slash gender non-normative discourses and discourses of black life. In this context, I want to understand self-determination as less a neoliberal rugged individualism and more as a coalitional ethics that is attentive to the kind of violence gendering does. In what sense, 
In other words, we might understand gender self-determination as a delinking and extrication from the gender binary uh, that then gives us over to a more ethical sociality and rena- relationality toward one another, a mutual aid and ethics of care for one another by way of a communal understanding of the self. In this way, we come to recognize the denizens of this anarchic commune, the blackness and transness of those who live and choose to do life in the sociality as not a list of legible identities that grant access or exclusion. As stated above, blackness and transness have an intimate relationship. They characterize more those who align with and inhabit the philosophical and existential milieu of rebellion deviance, non-normativity, and subversion of power. It is more a meta-identification that is reluctant to conveniently take on identities in place of doing the work of living and politicizing one's subjectivity via volatile principles and pointed political aims. This engenders a more tactical, combative modality in the face of capitalism, because capitalism is dependent on racial subsidies, the blackness of those who exceed the category black, for example, cultivates room for alliances that racial capitalism cannot anticipate, since racial differentiation is intrinsic to capitalist value creation and financial speculation. Indeed, capitalism has long co-opted epidermalized blackness into its fold. Capitalism, to be frank, has caught on to the game and continues to beat us at it. What I see as a kind of anarcho thread through blackness and transness must be claimed by anyone seeking to do the work. We must operate in other spaces via other modalities of thought. We must render blackness and transness as an anarchic sachet into another way of life. My understanding of blackness and transness stems from the way they act as forces of dispersal and differentiation. Blackness is inflected in and by transness, not blackness is transness, a transness understood as a refusal of circumscription and transparent arrival slash destination or origin. Black and trans as linked to movement, unfixation from normatively legible physiognomy, and a general refusal bear an intimate relationship and highlight that there can be no seamless partition between them under a racialized and gendered world. This is blackness's otherwise identification located in the interstices, frictional relations, and rebellious communing with those who are not supposed to relate with or to. This is a trans-inflected way of recomposing subjectivities in the name of liberation from imposed captivity in identificatory regimes, flight from what they told us we have always have to always be. It is a trans blackness that is anti anti category. Anti anti category. A preceding and subverting predilection for opposing cohesive categorization. The anarcho of black and trans subverts capitalistic ownership, opens them up to a pair of possession, an unproperty deployment and call to a coalitional fugitivity begotten by disaggregating it from its entrenchment with state interest with property. Capitalist tentacles, much less equipped to regulate purported strangers who create an ensemble on the grounds of unanticipated coalitional criteria or non-criteria and threaten to create treason, changing and expanding black radical politics provides for new opportunities, necessary opportunities to contradict and undermine hegemonic forces. All of this might lead to in the provocative language of a Joanna Zelinska, the end of white man, 
In this section, I have been attempting to bring about the obliteration of the purportedly impenetrable edifices that uphold white supremacy and cis sexist patriarchy. What such an attempt ultimately amounts to is the end of the white man. This is not white man bashing. Few would advocate such a goal as if this would eliminate the structure and histories that pervade all of our lives. Such a goal would wrongly presume that white supremacy and cis sexist patriarchy are merely the product of individual people committing biased acts. To to precipitate the end of white men is an apocalyptic or anarchic discourse that advances an ethical opening rather than solely an existential threat, an opening out into something that radically departs from the current state and state. If we live amid pervasive racial and gender capitalism, our anarchic yearning must be for a world before globalization and before neoliberal capitalism, which might be aptly read as and through Susan Stryker's anarchic womb, a trans and transitive primordiality that gives us over to something non-categorical. <clears throat> From the blackness and transness of an anarchic critique of Western civilization, a la Cedric Robinson's definitional black radical tradition, we are motivated to change that which touts itself immutable. The devastation wrought by the capitalist model that our globalized world now depends on requires rethinking from the ambit of anarcho-blackness articulable through radical trans and feminist critiques of sociality. There can be no shortness of liberation if we will ourselves toward an anarchism that demands justice and liberation for the most marginalized, the black, and the trans. It is the current state of affairs that disallows their liberation. Any anarchism interested in devastating the state and its hierarchies must attend acutely to the margins or the black and woman and trans reside as the life and livability of all as anarchists purport that is our concern and that all will not be adequately tended to if we remain in a position of objectivity a position that takes its cue from the vantage of white masculinity so often we presume to be parochial and particular anarchist opposition to the state and capitalism coupled with racial and gender critiques from the purview of blackness and transness from black feminism from anarcho-blackness is the perspective from which we gain the widest vision of the task at hand. So we seek the end of white men in order to think more broadly, a commitment to dismantling the all hierarchies being concerned with all oppressed people demands the dismantling of the ontological and epistemological habitus of the white man. To care for those of different and varied gender expressions and desires means a disdain for those discourses, systems, subjectivities that instantiate the impossibility and, if shown to be possible, extermination of of variations in gender identification. Such is an epitomized by the subject of the white man, a subjectivity one tries to attain in order to come into a particular kind of being rather than simply an ontological fact about a certain demographic. More clearly, Zelinska puts it this way. So even though the, the end of man and embedded with it an implicit whiteness and cisness may indeed signal the possible withering of a particular form of white Christian masculine subjectivity as the dominant orientation of our cultural and political discourses, it is meant to read as a diagnosis of a political condition and a positing of a political opportunity rather than as a psychological or biological diagnosis of the extinction of a particular species. It also needs to be acknowledged that structurally there is nothing about the imaginary reign of, say, women that would guarantee a fullness of society and a happily ever after. 
She is referring to a particular worldly orientation that foregrounds white Christian masculinity, where this orientation is the lay of the land that defines the state and social hierarchies. Disruption of this begets a political and existential opportunity to explore alternative possibilities of life, anarchic possibilities. The current political schema is the result of the onslaught of white masculinity pervading how we structure sociality, thus blackness and transness as perversions of torques of such an orientation spurned by white masculinity provide a kind of medicinal cure to the world in which we find ourselves. A focus on transness as a radical critique of masculinity doesn't pit particular bodies against one another, since, as Zelinska notes, the reign of women would not necessarily lead us in the right direction, but understands them as ways of inhabiting social and political space. White masculinity has oriented us toward political space. Oh, wait. No. White masculinity has oriented us toward war, coercion, violence, force, and the like. Transness, as what Kai M. Green calls in the first instance a reorientation to orientation, provides another way of unstructuring sociality. It is this radical reorientation of which prefixal anarcho refers a departure from the normative, a normativity characterized by the white masculinity of a hierarchical coercive state. Perhaps then what we are striving for is another genre of life. What we have now is one saturated with the, with a stultifying violence, looking to other and other way, otherwise ways of life being lived outside the state gives us different genres of life and sociality. The Silvio Winter-esque genre of man that has structured both our world and how we relate to others is a radicalized and gendered violence that disallows, indeed, instantiates the violent exclusion of and the validity of modes of life and embodiment outside its constitutive whiteness and cis masculinity. The white man is an illusion that per winter we no longer need because it, it because it inter alia threatens the livability of our species planetary habitat the black and trans of our anarchic pursuits the anarcho is our guide to remaking consciously and collectively the new society in which our existential referent we in the horizons of humanity, those who mobilize the masterless and rulerless anarcho of the black and trans of our anti and anti matter, will all now live. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.